So we're going to be talking about doubt in the book of Job. So the first thing I want to do is just kind of give you the overall theme of where I'm going with this whole retreat. I think, I think what's neat about being at a retreat is hopefully I'll get to build this theme um, throughout the course of the retreat. So let me read you this line. Navigating doubt means seeking God with humility and honesty despite uncertainty. Okay? Navigating doubt means seeking God with humility and honesty despite uncertainty. And so with that, I want to define doubt a little bit. Now, you'll notice I use the word uncertainty to define, to define doubt, and that's one aspect of doubt, um, that you're not certain about something that you don't know, right? Uncertainty has this idea of not knowing, right? The other aspect of doubt that I want to define is, uh, is the skeptical part, is the unbelief, okay? So there's two aspects of doubt. There's the uncertainty aspect, and then there's the unbelief aspect, the skeptic part. And both of them kind of compose what we understand today um, as doubt. And I'm going to talk about how to navigate both, right? And, and clearly, there's something more negative and pernicious and, and you could say evil about the unbelief part, the unbelief in God. Um, and yet, that's also, sometimes it's not easy to tell the difference between unbelief and just being uncertain, right? And what I hope to do is create some space um, within this retreat um, and maybe just within um, the church to be able to kind of probe those questions of when there's uncertainty and when there may be unbelief. Because I think one of the issues is that in our culture today, there isn't much space to ask questions and have dialogue. Okay? And that's one of the themes we're going to be talking about. Um, we look at, especially our political climate, um, it's very polarized, which means people disagree with each other. And there's actually certainty on both sides and not a lot of dialogue and gentleness and being able to have space to ask questions. And what I hope to... Um, kind of encourage is a space to ask questions and frankly to be able to express and I think Josh kind of talked about this Pastor Josh um, express sadness okay and pain and anger and frustration so a lot of this weekend will be giving you an outlet to express um, negative emotions essentially okay negative emotions and so to that end uh, Pastor Josh talked about this poetry exercise we're going to do a poetry exercise Um, Most of what we're going to be doing in the text this weekend is poetry. Job, the book of Job, is 90-something percent poetry. It's it's mostly poetry. And I would say, depending on how you estimate it, about a third, a third of the Bible is poetry. And so what I hope for us to do is to see how poetry is the language of suffering, both the language of suffering and also the language of doubt. A lot of doubts and questions come through poetry. Poetry. Now, the, the issue, though, is that questions may come through poetry, but answers don't necessarily come as easily. Okay, so I want to I prepare you that we're going to ask a lot of questions this weekend, um, and that what will go along with that is you'll probably end up with more questions than perhaps you came in with. And if so, praise God. <laughs> praise God, because there's something about navigating doubt that the more questions you have, um, there's something good about that. There's something spiritual about having more not less questions, and not necessarily having answers for them. Okay, so I, I want you to be okay that there's going to be some uncertainty um, and some unknown left, um, and maybe a lot of unknown left as a result this weekend. I think a lot of us approach um, coming to a retreat like, I'm going to accumulate knowledge, right? We're going to collect knowledge this weekend. What did you learn? That's something new. Um, actually have a very different goal this weekend. Um, if anything, I probably want to uh, allow you to dump some stuff off, okay? Dump some knowledge off. Okay, and have you um, experienced something different by channeling some of, the, some of the pain and suffering that you guys have been through um, through poetry. Right? That's the purpose of the exercise. Um, in the same way Job is able to um, express much of his pain and suffering through poetry, that's my hope for you all this weekend. Okay? And I think this will be, it'll be a little bit of a challenge because I think in the group that I did this with, it was a smaller group. Right? And I think it's, it can be easier to do in a smaller group. And yet, I, I believe this group is up for it. I think you guys are up for it. I've, I've spoken in various contexts, and I think you guys, I think you guys can, can do this. And we'll be, I'll be giving instructions. In fact, I'll start giving instructions tonight as we, uh, we kind of talk through this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about this book, the book of Job. Um, I, anyone familiar with the Enneagram? Anyone familiar with the Enneagram? Okay, not as many people as hope, so let's skip that part. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I have a personality that really enjoys um, having fun and doing fun things. 
and that avoids pain. Okay, avoids pain and escapes pain and suffering. And so when I encounter the book of Job, reading it is like, um, I used to really hate the uh, cherry cough syrup as a kid um, because it just tastes it's disgusting. It just triggered this gag reflex. So reading the book of Job or, or studying it and meditating it was kind of like, for me, sipping on a gallon of cherry cough syrup and like fighting back the gag reflex as it's happening all the time while I'm saying, it's good for me, it's good for me, right? Um, and so the, you may have this experience as you go through this book because it is about suffering and it is about pain um, if you have a, a personality that's similar to mine. But, but trust me, there's something good here, okay? There's something good that's going to happen. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, this, this, the title of today's talk is Doubt and Humility, okay? We're going to talk about the humility aspect and we're just going to dive right in. I, I know sometimes Friday night can be tough because you're coming in from your week um, and you've got all this stuff that's happened. And I was just talking about Pastor Josh. You know, he's got, you know, trying to wrangle three kids in a car, going through traffic. And um, my wife and I were talking through a whole bunch of stuff on the way here, too, about our kids. And I was getting frustrated with her driving. And you know what I mean? So I know all of us kind of come in here with various distractions. And so um, maybe, maybe what I can do is maybe I can pray again and to ask the Spirit of God to kind of speak through as I, as I read the Word. Father God, would you, uh, we invite your presence here, we invite your Spirit, and thank you for, um, as Pastor Josh prayed, thank you for the singing. Thank you for that we can um, express our hearts to you through music. Thank you that um, poetry, we're surrounded by poetry um, in the form of music, and it speaks to us, and thank you for giving us that avenue. And Lord, so would you awaken us to the poetic elements that we're surrounded by all the time, including music, including the way we worship. And so, God, I pray that you would also open us up to um, using that expression, using words to express our doubt um, and questions and pain and suffering to you this weekend. We trust you. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the first aspect of doubt that I want to talk about is that, um, my first point, is that doubts reveal a conflict between theology and experience, okay? Doubts reveal a conflict between theology and experience. So let me, let me give you an example of what that is. Um, how many of you, how many of you can drive? Who can drive here? Okay. How many of you have a driving philosophy, have a philosophy of driving? Can someone share with me their philosophy of driving? Some of you may not know what that means, but I, some, I think some of you do. So if, can someone share their philosophy of driving? Yeah, Joe. That's good. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So some people will, uh, will say, um, you know, I think someone in the front said, you know, their philosophy of driving is not to die, right? <laughs> it's not to die. And that's honest, and I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, people say a lot of things about how they drive, like I'm a good driver and stuff like that. But you really don't know someone's driving philosophy until what? Until you actually sit in the car with them. And then you know what someone's driving philosophy is. Like, for instance, what do you say? Defensive driving, it's always someone else's fault, right? Some people's driving philosophy is, right? And they won't say this, right? But it's always someone else's fault, right? Or another one is uh, everyone is conspiring to keep me from getting where I'm supposed to be, right? Some people have, so no one would actually say it, but if you watch the way they drive, if you're in the car with them, they act like everyone is conspiring to keep them from getting where they want to go. I, I feel that a lot. I feel that, I felt that coming here. Like people, are, people on the road are actively conspiring to keep me from getting to this place, right? Um, so do you see what I'm saying? There's one thing that we can say about our philosophy, right? And I'm going to go towards God on this. But there's what actually we do, right? And what we do reveals more about our view than what we say. Okay, let me give you one more example. How many of you have a, a, how many of you are students? Any students here? How many of you have a studying philosophy? Does anyone have a studying philosophy? And by the way, not studying is a philosophy, okay? <laughs> not studying is a philosophy. How many of you have a, can someone tell me their study philosophy? Like their, their, their school philosophy, how you approach school? Anybody, anybody brave enough to share their school philosophy? Yeah, go for it. C's get degrees. <laughs> Do they, though? Do they? <laughs> C's get degrees. I like that. So, um, so what I heard there was minimal effort, right? <laughs> I, heard, I heard minimal effort. Okay. I, I, I feel that. I feel that. In fact, my, my study philosophy was um, do less than whoever is around me 
I mean, do less, spend less effort, but try to do better and then brag about it, right? Um, spend as little effort as possible, but then brag about it to other people when I do better than them, right? So there's definitely some arrogance, you know, as part of that, right? Um, and then some other philosophies and other uh, school philosophies. Yeah, someone, Benson. What was that? I totally missed that. That was... <laughs> okay, he, uh, Benson said, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the crowd. I feel like that's grading on a curve, right? That's when, there, when there's a curve in the class, you just have to do better than the rest of them, than the, 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 the group, right, than the pack. Okay, totally get that. Anybody else have a study philosophy? Yes. Lillian, right? That's good, that's good. Okay, kind of minimal effort, but smarter, like kind of like a smart... <laughs> Kind of a smart way to do minimal effort. Okay, let me give you one more study philosophy that I have, which is um, procrastinate until the last second, uh, accumulate enough energy to actually work on it, and then work in a frenzy for 24 hours, and then stop, and then uh, relax, right? That's another, <laughs> that's another study philosophy. And then here's another philosophy that I've seen, especially among overachieving Asians, is um, uh, work super, super hard. Um, and, then bo- and then feel guilty that you didn't work hard enough, no matter what happens, um, and then re- rinse and repeat and continue to feel guilty even though you study a lot, right? And so, again, so th- everyone's got a, a philosophy that they say, right? Everyone has a philosophy that they say, but you know what's real by what you do, okay? By what you do. And so when it comes to theology, and theology is just a fancy word for the philosophy about God, right? Everyone has um, a view of God, and we, you, no one, you don't really know what it is until, uh, frankly, suffering happens, right? Your, your uh, view of God is revealed um, when suffering happens, okay? Um, and so doubts um, are that rift, right, where you have a certain view of God, and then you have this experience, and then you're like, what? What just happened? How do I bridge this gap? And a, and a perfect example um, I, you know, I shared this message a couple weeks ago, um, and the pastor um, lost a child. Okay, he lost a, he lost a child uh, soon after birth, and he he knew he was actually there was actually the great uh, risk of that um, because there was a congenital defect that the doctor um, told him about before the child was born. And so when he and his wife were told, um, they just paused. They were reflective, um, and they were silent, and they were just kind of processing. And then the doctor said, wow, you guys have taken this, uh, you guys have taken this really well. Um, and then my friend said, hey, um, how, how, how do people take it? Um, and, he, and, and the doctor said, well, um, there's sometimes screaming, you know, often some screaming and yelling, um, and then uh, cursing, cursing God. And I thought this was really interesting, right? Because I bet you, and, I, and I'm pretty confident, um, some of the people that curse God actually uh, don't even profess any faith, <laughs> okay? They may not even profess faith, but in that moment um, where suffering has occurred, um, there is this sudden exposure of the true belief of the person. Okay? And doubts are part, are reveal that. Uh, suffering and doubt reveal when you have that gap between everything you've learned about God and what you actually experience. Um, and that, that, that chasm, that gap, that's where doubt lives. And so what I want to do is, uh, I want to, you know, the whole, the whole premise of the book of Job is Job is having, a, you know, most of the book, probably 70% or so, 70% of the book of Job is he's having this conversation between him and three friends, um, essentially about theology, about their view of God. And I'm not actually going to get too much into the context of Job. Let me just give you real quick. He's a righteous man, okay? He is upright in all his behavior. And what happens to him is uh, a bunch of terrible, tragic things. He loses all of his children. I think he has, uh, no, I think has eight children. All of his children die. Okay, they're all killed. Um, and then um, uh, he has boils break out all over his body. Okay, and there's actually some backstory to all of this, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, and, then, um, and then let me read you what one of his friends say, because there's a theology in what his friends say to him. Because most of the book is this, di- like I said, this dialogue, and it's all in this poetry form. form. So I'm going to read uh, Job chapter 20, verses 4 to 11. Do you not know this from of old, 
since man was placed on earth, that the exalting of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless but for a moment. Though his height mount up to the heavens, and his head reach to the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place any more behold him. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hands will give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. I'm going to ask this question a lot this weekend. What did you hear? What did you hear in this, uh, in these, uh, what, six lines of poetry? Seven. What did you hear? Okay, I expected silence. I'll read it again. <clears throat> oh, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Lillian, did you want to add something? Life can be bleak and dismal. I heard more of the former. I heard more of Francis, right? I heard more of what Francis. Let me read, let me read it again, and let's, let's, see what, let's, see what, if you, let's see which one you hear. Um, uh, Job 24 through 11. Do you, know that, do you not know this from old, of old? since man was placed on earth, that the exalting of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless but for a moment. Though his height mount up to the heavens and his head reach to the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. What's dung? Yeah, feces, thank you. Oh, there's other words too. Um, those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place any more behold him. His children will seek the favor of the poor, and his hands will give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Okay, what did you hear? Or anyone want to add anything to what was heard, to what was said? Cheng. Right. But it's all in one very specific regard. Let me give you uh, verse 5. Verse 5 is kind of the hinge verse there. The exalting of the wicked is short. The joy of the godless but for a moment. Okay, that's the key, that's the key term there. And that's the, that's the theology. Okay? Wicked people don't last. Their prosperity, the prosperity of the wicked will not last. Okay? That's the theology. Okay? Does that make sense? And essentially what uh, Job's friend is saying is that those who suffer deserve it because they've done something wicked. That's the theology his friends are giving. Okay? And Job's response is, show me what I've done wrong. Please tell me, what have I done wrong to deserve what is happening? Okay? He is questioning, he, he is disagreeing with his friends, and he's saying, look, you have a theology of blessing and works, okay, or works and blessing, where those who do what is right are rewarded for it, right? And that is generally true. Actually, I, I'm, I've given percentages. Let's, let's say that's true from like 50 to 90% of the time, that if you do the right thing, God will reward you. God will do good things for you. Okay, that's true, because this is straight from Proverbs. What uh, Job 20 is super like wisdom from Proverbs, and Job is considered wisdom literature. But Job's response, the person Job, his response is like, no, that's not true, because look, I am, he's a righteous person, remember, right? And, and suffering has been inflicted on him, and he's like, I don't know what I've done wrong. I don't know. And so he is experiencing doubt. <laughs> he's experiencing doubt. And honestly, I don't know if it's totally clear which one he's feeling. Is it unbelief? Or is it uncertainty? It's probably some of both, right? It's probably this mixture, but he is questioning God. So let me just, uh, let me just leave you with this. Number one, doubts reveal a conflict. Like I said, a conflict between our theology and our experience. What Job is going through uh, is rubbing against, is conflicting, contradicts what he has been taught about God. 
that the righteous are rewarded for good works. And so let me give a quick example of how um, I was taught that, and not even from a Christian perspective. Okay? Um, recently, I've kind of learned about my, my father's history, my dad's history. And my dad's from Hong Kong, and he, um, his, he's adopted, and his uh, adoptive father, whom he actually never met, um, died when he was six years old. So his family's source of income uh, ended, basically, when he was six. And so then my mom had to go to work, because my, my grandfather lived in the U.S., actually. Um, and so my mom went to work, and my dad had to fend for himself. And, uh, and that was part of his upbringing, is he, he kind of grew up in this abusive household, or n- neglected most of the time, and then later went to live with um, his sister and my, her sis- my sis- his sister's husband, his brother-in-law, um, who's a lot older than him, and it was a really abusive and difficult childhood. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because for most of my childhood, for much of my childhood, before my dad became a believer, um, my dad on Sundays, or on the weekends, would tell us these stories of how much, how poor he was and how much he suffered. And the purpose of these stories was always like to, to guilt me, right? To guilt my brother and I um, about how good we have it. Um, and so I gradually kind of had this theology in my head that I need to work hard, right? This philosophy that I need to work hard and do well. Um, and so I don't know if that's a, if that's a part of your story as well. Um, but I'm guessing, how many of you are, 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 are children of immigrants? Okay. How many of you? Okay, most of you. Um, most of you are the children of Im- immigrants. So um, that narrative, um, especially the one about growing up poor and then making it to this country, um, whether you're a Christian or not, I bet you it's kind of like a, a, a part of who you are. Okay. It's actually a, a narrative, a, a story that has been told to you, um, wh- again, whether you're a Christian or not. Um, and even despite what you may believe about God, I bet you it kind of informs the things that you do. Okay. It kind of uh, is part of the way you operate. So um, just like I said, everyone's got a studying philosophy or a driving philosophy. You probably have a, a life philosophy that kind of revolves around if you work hard um, and, be, and, and, and if you work hard, you'll be successful. If you get a right education, you'll be, you'll be blessed. Right? So there is a theology of blessing and works that might be operating um, somewhere in your life. And I'd just like you to kind of think about that. My next point. <clears throat> That doubts often reveal unbelief in God's goodness. Doubts often reveal unbelief in God's goodness. This is Job 23, um, 1 through 6. Then Job answered, Even today, my complaint is still bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I, could, that I could come to his place of residence. He's talking about God. I would lay out my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know with what words he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me with great power? No, he would only pay attention to me. Let me read that again. Um, Then Job answered, Even today my complaint is still bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I could come to his place of residence. I would lay out my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know with what words he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me with great power? No, he would only pay attention to me. Okay, um, what did you hear? God cares. Okay, okay, God cares. What else did you hear? Yeah, yeah, I, I do hear God cares toward the end, but I think the main, the main kind of emotion is um, it, it's like a courtroom. Right? Yeah, you know what I mean? It, like it says in verse 4, I would lay out my case. And I don't know if that courtroom, I don't know if courtrooms existed at that time, so it might be anachronistic to say that, but it sounds like he wants to defend himself. He really wants to defend himself. And he's like, hey, I need to, I need to plead my case before God. Right? And this is, a, this is kind of an interesting thing. 
Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a pride here that's demanding God be his audience. God, you need to explain yourself because um, I've got some, I've got a beef, <laughs> okay? I, I, you, need to, you need to account for what's happening here, right? So again, um, when doubts happen, it reveals that gap between theology and experience. And so what do we do with it? Well, um, in this case, Job is like, look, God, I've got, this, uh, I've got this problem here, and you need to explain yourself. Lillian, go ahead. Good. That's good. Yeah, so, so I, I think you said something really important. There's a, just, there's a justice part that's important here. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about anger, and I think you can hear a little bit of anger um, in Job's expression, right? Um, and often behind anger, because anger is a secondary emotion, um, is a defense of something, right? And I think what Job is um, complaining about is that there has been an injustice, okay? Somehow, God, your, your character here is in question because I'm experiencing some injustice, okay? And so let's examine what is the injustice that, uh, that Job is experiencing, right? Well, let me, let me, let me bring you these two um, kind of ideas that Job may be keeping in his head. Number one, that God's character is good and that God brings good to those who are good. Okay? So one, number one, God's character is upright and righteous. And then on the other hand, at, at, at the same time, God does good to those who behave well, who, who behave righteously. Okay? And those two are kind of like connected, right? Those go together. And yet... What Job is experiencing is, I've been a good person, okay? I've been a good person, but I'm not experiencing good right now. So what does that mean? Well, uh, it means your character is in question. It means God's character is in question, right? And so that's the injustice that Job is um, crying out against, that there has been an injustice here. Um, And so this is where... uh, the true view of God is being exposed, and Job's got to contend with this. And so let me give, a, let me give, a, let me give an image. Um, let me offer an image of, of what God might be like. Um, and it's, someone shared this at this uh, last retreat. He said, you know what? Sometimes I think God is kind of like a Chinese gangster. Yeah, I know. It's strange, right? Chinese gangster. And so, um, and I was like, yeah, 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 I don't know what you mean. Uh, I don't know why you say Chinese gangster. Um, and he explained to me, and what he meant was... Um, I guess in terms of, uh, and, I, and I guess for me it's more mafia, um, there's this thing about protection money, right? So if you have a store in a neighborhood that's run by a gang, um, you know, because the gangs ha- operate in kind of these territories, then, and you're a, you're a proprietor, let's say you have a laundry, right, laundromat, right? Um, and then you will pay the gangster who runs your territory in order to protect you from other people, really to protect you from himself, okay? It's to protect you from the gang. You are essentially have to pay money to protect yourself from the gang. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so his point was, God is like a Chinese gangster in that he demands something of us as Christians to protect us from him. <laughs> okay? God asks for our faith and good behavior so that he won't punish us. Okay? That's a theology. <laughs> okay? That is a view of God. And you know what? I bet you, even though most of you would never say that, when suffering happens, you might see God that way. Okay? You might see God that way. Okay? And that's kind of what Job is going through. He's like, God, you do good for those who pay you, right? Because you're, and that's what makes you good. And so if I'm not getting my protection, then you must not be good. And so what Job is having to wrestle with now is either God's character is corrupt, he doesn't do what he says, or maybe God doesn't necessarily reward, always reward with good. Okay. Um, and you know, frankly, either way, it's kind of disturbing. <laughs> okay. It's either, either way, it's kind of disturbing. Um, and we have to contend with that. Um, but I think the ultimate question that Job is asking, or that the book of Job is asking is, uh, what, is it possible to love someone um, not for what they do for you, but for who they are. That's ultimately the question of Job. That's ultimately the question he's asking. And it's not an easy answer. In fact, the, the book doesn't completely answer that question. Okay, and then let me read you another uh, passage in um, Job 31, 5 through 8. 
This is Job again, kind of examining himself. He says, If I have walked in falsehood, and if my foot has hastened to deceit, let him weigh me with honest scales. Then God will discover my integrity. If my footsteps have strayed from the way, if my heart has gone after my eyes, or if anything has defiled my hands, then let me sow and let another eat, and let my crops be uprooted. And essentially, again, this is repeating what Job is saying is, look, examine me. Let, tell me if I've done something wrong. And so what, there's something, um, let, me give you the, let me give you the last point, that humility means accepting the limitations of our wisdom and trusting God's ways. And I think what is amazing about Job is even though there is a pride and an arrogance to um, what Job says, what is amazing about Job is he um, responds to God. Everything that he says is directly engaging with the Creator. And so a lot of times we think about humility as being thinking of ourselves less, and that's, that's definitely part of it, right? Accepting our limitations and thinking of ourselves less. But I want to give you a different definition of humility. It also means depending on others, okay? That humility not only means accepting your own limitations, but it means actively engaging another person in relationship. It means, it means to depend on someone else, okay? A lot of times we emphasize so much like the self-effacing part of it. And I think a lot of that comes from being Asian, right? We want to we wanna kind of like erase ourselves, right? Um, but actually, if you look biblically speaking, what humility is about, um, it really is about dependence, Okay. And even in Job's arrogance of demanding an audience before God, notice he is willing to engage with God. He is willing to, like Jacob, wrestle with God. And like Jacob, he doesn't emerge unscarred. He is scarred in the process, but he learns something about God um, through, through the journey. Okay. And so, um, and so how do I know that? How do I know that um, everything Job says is good? Let me just read you, and I, I didn't put it in the, in, the, um, in the presentation, but let me read you toward the end of Job um, 42, 7 and 8. This is the narrative portion. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, and I'll read you some of the words he says, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, this is one of Job's friends who gives this theology of blessing and works, my anger burns against you. And against your two friends, these are the friends of Job who have tried to comfort him, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has." Okay, so there's something about even Job's questioning, even though it's not, uh, even though there's a, a prideful aspect of it, there's a part of him that's demanding justice, there's still this engagement with God, this direct wrestling with who God is that God honors and recognizes. Um, but then what, what, does, uh, what does God say to Job? Let me read Job 38. Verses 1 through 7. I know I'm going through a lot of texts. I just want to give you tonight kind of like a, an experience of the poetry um, that is in this book. Job 38, 1 through 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? I won't read that again, but what did you hear? What did you hear in what I just read? And what did you see? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, that's right. Do you know who I am? With a little like, yeah. Um, there is a sense, there's some rhetorical questioning here. Um, and there's some images 
right? There's some images and some metaphors that are being laid out there, like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Is that, what kind of question is that? Yeah, it's rhetorical. It's a rhetorical question. It's not meant to be answered. And just like you said, it's like, do you know who I am? It's like, let me tell you who I am by asking you these questions that you cannot answer, right? And again, there is a sense of like, um, you have stepped outside (laughs) of where you're supposed to be, right? You have stepped outside. You don't know your place right now. I think the term is you're too big for your own britches, right? Um, This is the idea. What God is saying is, look, you're you're outside of your pay grade. I'm sorry, I'm using all these metaphors. The idea is uh, Job needs to accept his limitations, okay? He accepts the limitations of his wisdom. There is someone, there's a creator who knows better than him and actually does not have to tell him the full story. And in fact, as, we'll, as we continue to journey through Job, you will find out, well, I'll just tell you at the end, Job does never finds out um, why he's experienced suffering. In fact, you as the reader get, get, get way more information about Job's suffering than he ever gets, which is pretty sobering because it probably indicates something about the suffering that we experience. We may not ever, on this side of heaven, get an explanation of suffering. If Job didn't, who was the, mo- was the most righteous man at that time, maybe we don't get an answer either. Even this man who says what's right about God and questions him uh, still doesn't get an answer. And so there's this aspect throughout Scripture that go- God is always opposing the proud, consistently throughout Scripture, always opposing the proud. Um, and so I want to address a, a couple things at the end as we conclude. Number one, that when suffering happens, our temptation is to want meaning and to blame someone. There's always someone we want to blame. I was talking with an engineer from Google, um, and there might be other Google people here, right? Um, And he said there's something, yeah, Benson, right. Um, There's something that they do at Google called a uh, blameless postmortem. Have you heard of that? A blameless postmortem. And in a blameless postmortem, this is after a project goes live, after a project's implemented, um, everyone on the project team uh, brainstorms all the things that could have been done better, right? And the whole idea of having it be blameless, it's no one's responsible. It's no one's fault, right? If something went wrong, no one's going to blame anyone, okay? Um, and I thought, that's a good idea, but you know what? I'd still be really, uh, I'd, I'd still probably like try to defend myself. I try, would have this thing where you, it's called CYA, anyways. Um, you would still try to protect yourself in those situations because even though people say there's no one to blame, usually there's always someone to blame, right? Um, the only way I would, I would say to, to, be, to encourage total honesty is if there would be a, a blaming postmortem and there was someone who beforehand had agreed they were going to be responsible for all the blame, okay? The only way you're going to have complete honesty in a situation after a project or something is... is is put in place, or it fails, is if someone is willing to take responsibility no matter what, okay? No matter what the reality is, is if someone's willing to take responsibility. And I think that is the uh, amazing thing about God, is that even though we are screwed up um, and we're, we are limited in our wisdom um, and often evil, God in his justice is willing to, and his mercy is willing to take all the blame. He's willing to take it all upon himself, okay? Um, Through the cross, through his son, through Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If God is willing to take all the blame and willing to take responsibility even for things that weren't his own doing, you know, our our sin and depravity, then you don't actually get to question, (laughs) okay? That's the point. You don't actually get to decide uh, when he does and when he doesn't. Okay, and so let me read um, toward the end of Job. This is uh, Job 33, 23 and 24. Okay, now actually I'll read to 23 to 26. This is Elihu. It's a young guy who is not part of the three friends, and this is what he says to Job. He said, if there be for him, and he's talking about Job, um, an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand, to declare to man what is right for him. And he is merciful to him and says, deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Let us Flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God, and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy, and he restores to man his righteousness. 
Let me keep reading, 27 and 28. He sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what is right, it was, and it was not repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. And notice in that first verse, that's verse 23, if there be to him an angel, a mediator. And what, uh, what Elihu is talking about is if there would just be someone who could take the blame, who could take responsibility for even a man's evil actions, who could rescue even when man has screwed up and is evil and has perverted and, and sinned what is right. If there could just be that person, then this gap between theology and experience could be bridged because someone could take all the blame for it. And he is pointing to Jesus Christ. It's for foreshadowing what Jesus would do by taking it all. And so here's kind of the, uh, here's kind of the thing, that no matter what's happened in your life, that God ultimately gives himself. That God has given himself on the cross. And that, again, doesn't guarantee that your life will be free from suffering. So there is a truth in that uh, good things do happen um, to good people. And yet there's also this reality that God, everything God gives is by his grace. That no matter what happens is by his grace. That we don't, we're not entitled to anything. Um, and recently I went to, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, two months ago, went with my dad back to Hong Kong to visit um, his, his, where he grew up. And it was neat because as he was reflecting about his journey, and he, he's very aware how he gave us this, he fed us this narrative of um, growing up really poor and then working really hard um, and making the American dream. But as we were sitting um, in a cafe and he was recollecting everything that happened, he's become a believer, he said, you know what though? Um, I realized every break that I received, it had nothing to do with how hard I worked or how smart I was. It was by the grace of God that he did it. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with my righteousness because it goes both ways, okay? Hear this. It goes both ways. God can absolutely allow suffering even to the righteous, but the beauty of grace is that he um, is good to those who don't deserve it. And my dad recognized that he began to have doubts. Um, that the reason he came to faith is he began to doubt his own narrative of the theology of blessing and works. Because he realized no matter what he did, God could bless him and worked in his life um, to bring him to the U.S. to meet um, his wife, my mom, um, to have kids, um, to meet Jesus, um, and to be, um, to be who he is today. And so my prayer for you today is that you would come before God in humility, accepting the limitations of your wisdom, that your theology may not be complete, and that won't be revealed um, until you go through suffering or until you experience doubt but that through the process of doubt, you would increase your dependence and have a fuller view of who he is. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the gift of poetry. Thank you that you speak to us through images. Um, you speak to us through um, this revealed theology, and you speak to us through um, books like Job um, that give voice to suffering and pain and even anger. Um, and so, Lord, I pray that um, I know... Um, there are those here tonight who are, are suffering, who are questioning, um, who are experiencing doubt, both, um, both unbelief and uncertainty. Um, and so I pray that you would reveal um, areas where there is uh, disappointment and hurt and injustice, you know, experienced injustice um, regarding you. Um, and I pray that your spirit would lead into truth um, and that those, um, those feelings of frustration and disappointment, um, they could be directed um, towards you. Um, and I pray that you would hear them. And I pray that you would, uh, you would hear and you would listen. And Lord, I don't know um, when you might respond, but I pray that as that questioning happens, Lord, you would usher in your presence and you would bring a fuller view of who you are. And that you would expose where our theology, our view of you, uh, may be incomplete. Where we may still be holding on um, to this theology of works. Where we still view you um, as a Chinese gangster who is extorting us to protect us from you. Lord, would you bring us a fuller experience of what it means to know you, um, even amidst the doubt. We pray this in your name. Amen.